scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. We've signed a climate convention on the importance of economic instruments and free markets were included in this mammoth uh, Agenda 21 document and the Rio Declaration. Uh, let me be clear on one fundamental point. Uh, the United States fully intends to be the world's preeminent leader in protecting the global environment. Coming up, Technocracy News. Welcome to today's edition of Technocracy News and Trends. I'm Patrick Wood, Editor-in-Chief of Technocracy News and Trends, and today is June 25, 2019. Today we're going to start out with an article about gene editing of the human germline. We recently noted a story from China where a Chinese scientist had gone rogue, supposedly gone rogue, and gene edited an embryo to have resistance against HIV. And the Chinese government, when it found out about it, was very upset on the surface. The scientist disappeared for a period of time, hiding out. He's since come back. The Chinese government now, for some reason, is tolerating this guy. And the babies have been born. And geneticists across the world have expressed their outrage against this breach of moral ethics but have no fear, whatever's happening in China is now happening in Russia as well. And I dare say the cat is out of the bag with human genetic engineering. Once the human germline is modified, those changes will be permanently inherited by future generations. Look out. Other DNA will mix with the edited DNA and the results are completely unknown. The article states a, a Russian scientist says he wants to create more genetically modified babies, flouting international objections that such a step would be premature, unethical, and irresponsible. The scientist's name is Denis Rebikoff. He's a molecular biologist who heads a gene editing lab in Moscow. He claims he's developed a safe and therefore acceptable way to create gene-edited babies. So he says during an NPR interview, how it can be unethical if we will make a healthy baby instead of diseased. Why? Why is it unethical? It's interesting that he was interviewed on NPR, by the way. That's National Public Radio in the United States. Why NPR would give this guy a platform, I have no idea. But nevertheless, Rebikoff wants to create babies from MBOs whose DNA he would edit to protect the resulting children from HIV. Rebikoff would edit a gene called CCR5 to replicate a naturally occurring variation that protects people from HIV. The rationale is to guarantee that the baby will be HIV negative. That's it, Rebikoff says. The problem, of course, is where do you draw the line on what genes should be edited? What's the next disease that will be tackled? Or the next trait that some scientist doesn't like in humans? Perhaps one day they'll tackle emotional issues like anger and jealousy and rage, or perhaps the color of your hair or eyes or your height. I recollect an article some years ago that was written by a transhuman group that suggested that humans could be genetically engineered to live in the night rather than in the daytime, and they gave all kinds of good examples on this and why that would be a good thing. And the idea was to genetically modify humans to give them cat eyes so they could see in the night. And then it would be perfectly natural for humans to live at night and not in the daytime. Well, genetic engineering, as I said now, is out of the bag. And scientists across the world are going to rush into this and there'll be nobody to stop them. You might stop two or three, you might stop 10%, but you're not going to stop all of them. The race is on. The next story has to do, again, with Alphabet. You'll remember in previous posts on Technocracy News and Trends that we've covered Alphabet's new smart city construction in Canada, and Toronto has given an area to Alphabet Sidewalk Labs to build a smart city from scratch. 
Now, admittedly, this is land that may not have the greatest economic value, except that something be built on top of it. But Sidewalk Labs has been in hot pursuit of doing this for some time and has taken a lot of heat. All of a sudden, the public has turned against them. They've realized what it is really doing to them. They see data privacy as being the number one issue. And so Sidewalk Labs has been in battle now for months, and the project is in jeopardy. Well, now the company is not only backpedaling, but you can tell that they're trying to salvage the project because if they don't have any public support, they're dead in the water. So the CEO of Sidewalk Labs, Dan Doktoroff, had a press release the other day, and he said in this press release on Monday that Sidewalk Labs will not disclose personal information to third parties without explicit consent and will not sell personal information. Well, if anybody believes that, I've got a bridge that I'd like to sell them in Brooklyn. Of course, such a pledge has no teeth. There's nothing of a legal nature about it. It sounds to me like Sidewalk Labs is going to have every resident of Quayside sign a disclosure agreement, terms of service, and all that sort of thing, legalese. And unless they explicitly say that they can disclose their personal information, they won't do it. Well, this is the same thing we see on so many websites today where they require you to sign off on a terms of service that gives them permission anyway to do whatever they want to do. And I seriously doubt that the CEO's statement is going to carry any water with the people that are criticizing the whole operation at this point. And when the next CEO comes in to replace Dan Doktoroff, he's not obligated to abide by any promise that that CEO made. We'll see what happens on this. In the meantime, we can be glad that smart city technology is getting the once over by the citizens who will be subject to it. Americans would do well across our country to pay attention to Quayside. All of the same issues are on the table here as well. But where are our privacy activists? Basically, they're nowhere to be seen. The time now is to stand up and be seen before they build this stuff out and we're trapped. Once they have your data, they have it. You don't. Just that simple. The last story I want to spend a little bit of time on is concerning Elon Musk, our favorite technocrat. The headline of the story is Elon Musk Starship Development to Build the Martian Technocracy. This was actually a tweet that was sent out by Musk this week, and he said that he's accelerating Starship Development to build the Martian technocracy. One newspaper called him crazy. Well, that's just Elon Musk, you know. He says a lot of crazy things these days, and it's seemingly nonsensical. Well, it would be good if these journalists understood anything about technocracy. This is just clear as crystal to anyone who's been following technocracy news for very long. Elon Musk is a technocrat, and if he says he wants to create a Martian technocracy, that's exactly what he means. This is not unclear, and it's not crazy. He's a technocrat. This article says, while Buzz Lightyear goes to infinity and beyond, Elon Musk will have to settle for Mars for now. The CEO of SpaceX, Tesla, posted a series of cryptic tweets hitting at his plans to someday colonize a red planet. Musk said, accelerating starship development to build the Martian technocracy. Shortly after, he followed up with a meme with the text Occupy Mars and an image of the planet. For anyone else, the tweets would seem nonsensical, but for Musk, there's some applicable context. After all, his SpaceX is set to conduct his first nighttime launch of the Falcon Heavy rocket from Kennedy Space Center at Cape Canaveral Monday night. The 230-foot-tall rocket will carry 24 satellites for key customers, including the Department of Defense and NASA. Musk has long described the Falcon Heavy as a critical ship in his long-running bid to send rockets and people to Mars someday. Well, this article pokes skepticism and criticism at Musk for his far-reaching plan. But anybody that's followed, as I said, knows that Musk is dead serious about this. And I want to tell you why. Back on June 18, 2018, that's just a little over a year ago, I posted a story in Technocracy News called Shock. Elon Musk's grandfather was head of Canada's technocracy movement. That's right. This is a must-read story if you never read it. 
we identified Elon Musk as a technocrat on the basis of beliefs and actions. What we did not know is that his Canadian grandfather, Joshua Haldeman, was an avid supporter of technocracy, served as research director, and ultimately became the head of Technocracy Incorporated in Canada. This article started out, one of history's recurring themes is that technology sometimes outruns society, leaving politicians gasping to catch up with the consequences. So it was with the impact of the printing press, the steam engine, and the computer. Arguably, so it is again today with gene editing, social media, and artificial intelligence. While technologists often rail that politicians just do not get technology, politicians counter that technologists all too rarely grasp politics. One fascinating example of both sides of the debate was the history of the technocracy movement that briefly flourished in North America in the 1930s. The revolt of the engineers, as it was called, holds some interesting lessons for today. It was understandable that radical movements emerged in the U.S. in the 1930s in response to the Great Depression, just as communism and fascism proliferated in Europe. The technocracy movement argued that the best way out of the crisis was to reject the messiness of the market and old-fashioned politics and adopt a modern scientific point of view. In their introduction to technocracy, published in 1933, the movement's leaders declared that the riffraff of outdated social institutions was blocking progress and politicians should be swept aside just as alchemists and astrologers had previously given way to science. Traditional economics obsessed with arbitrary pricing mechanisms rather than rational production was nothing more than the, quote, pathology of debt. The story goes on to reveal that Joshua Haldeman, indeed, was not only an avid supporter, but also he was the head poobah of the technocracy movement in Canada. This is the grandfather under which Elon Musk grew up in South Africa. Yes, they moved from Canada as a family to South Africa, and I dare say that Elon learned everything that he knows today about technocracy from his grandfather. He is a technocrat, just plain and simple. America has their head in the sand on this whole issue. Every day I hear another charge against Marxism and communism and socialism and things like that, that these are the enemies of the people, that these are the things that will bury us, that these are the things that we must fight. Well, I would dare anyone to look at Elon Musk and call him a communist. I just dare you. You can't do it. He's not a communist. He's not a leftist. Sometimes he resembles that, I admit, but he's not. He's a technocrat. And technocrats are not communists. And it's not unusual that I hear criticism from people on my position that, well, technocracy has morphed into communism. No, it hasn't. That's just not true. Back in the 1930s, communists and technocrats hated each other. They wrote articles in newspapers across the country taking pot shots at each other. There was absolutely no love lost between the two movements. And basically, technocracy said that because... Communism did not reject a price-based economic system in favor of a resource-based economic system that they were completely wrong, completely outdated, completely out of touch with reality. It's what they said. And I dare say today that the issue is still the same. The technocrats want to completely transform the economic system just like they did in the 1930s. They begged FDR, by the way, when he became president, to declare himself dictator so that he could implement technocracy. And the first thing they wanted him to do was to dismiss Congress, send them all home. They wanted FDR simply just to appoint technocrats to run everything. I don't know how FDR himself would survive in such a scenario, but I expected he was threatened by it, and he said, no, we're not going to do that, and he didn't. Many technocrats, nevertheless, did make it into his administration, but he did not declare a dictatorship in order to implement technocracy. If people like Elon Musk could get away with doing this today, they would do exactly the same thing that they tried to do back then. That also goes for people like Jeff Bezos, for people like Eric Schmidt, formerly of Alphabet and Google. All of these people, collectively, that sit at the top of big tech are not communists. They're not leftists, by that definition anyway. They're not socialists. They're technocrats. Until America understands this fact 
and until America understands the mind of a technocrat like Elon Musk, we will never be able to pull out of the nosedive that we're in right now that will lead us straight into scientific dictatorship. I would again point out that Zbigniew Brzezinski, back in 1970 when he released his book Between Two Ages, America's Role in the Technotronic Era, pointed out how necessary Marxism and communism would be to the ultimate technotronic era that we're facing today, that is technocracy. And he said back then, it's absolutely essential for Marxism and communism and socialism to exist. The question is why? Why was it necessary? Was, was Brzezinski a Marxist? No, he wasn't. He was simply stating a fact. He said one is necessary for the other. It's like a stepping stone. You want to get to the ultimate technocrat, technocratic era? Okay, you need to have communism and Marxism to break it down. This is the great destroyer. In order for technocracy to rise out of the ashes, there needs to be ashes. How do you better break down and destroy a society by implementing communism and Marxist principles? That's exactly what's happening today. Those leftists who are attempting to rip the fabric of American society are doing the technocrats a favor. Destroy it all, they say. Burn it all down. We can reconstruct society in our own image, just like Sidewalk Labs is doing up in Quayside, Toronto. We can build a city from the ground up. We can have a much better utopia than anybody else ever dreamed up. And of course, if that were the case, Elon Musk might forestall his plans to build a technocracy on Mars in favor of building one in the good old planet Earth, maybe even in the good old USA. I don't think Musk would hesitate for a minute if he believed he could get away with it to establish technocracy here and now, not only in our country, but around the world as well. All of these things are better explained with more detail and more content in both of my books on technocracy. The latest one, Technocracy, The Hard Road to World Order, is available on Amazon as well as on technocracy.news. And my first book on technocracy, which was called Technocracy Rising, The Trojan Horse of Global Transformation, these two books are essential to get a handle on what technocracy is and what it intends to do. If you want to really understand what Musk is talking about, creating a technocracy on Mars, don't worry about Mars, worry about here, right now. These people are busy working out their plans while virtually no one is paying attention to them. Well, I am, and now you are. We know what we have to do. I'm Patrick Wood for Technocracy News and Trends. See you next time. Mm -hmm.